Wow. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to this last uh, lecture of Thai Paris, the fifth evening of uh, presentation during the Thai Paris uh, program. And um, I wish to this audience the best evening ever of the summer for <laughs> typography. So bye bye. See you later. See you, Sir François. Thank you. Um, uh, I will introduce the two lectures tonight. First, first uh, one is uh, Cléo Charuet from Cléo Bureau. Can you join me, Cléo? Yes. Um, and second one will be Lucas Sharp uh, afterward. No, uh, <laughs> just after. <Sorry. laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, to introduce Cléo, um, uh, I would like to, to, to tell you that she's an independent art director uh, based in Paris. She's uh, working, working sorry, for a wide range of commissioners um, and uh, she will talk about um, many different commissions that she did before, including, uh, for example, Hermès, uh, Monoprix or Paris Photo, uh, Photo Fair, uh, organized in Paris every year. Uh, she's also designing books and, uh, and various publications, journals and, and, uh, and different documents, printed documents. Um, after having uh, talked with her client in order to define a brief, uh, her approach is uh, to tell stories, let's say, throughout uh, images and text. Uh, you will see that her favorite tools are typography, of course, and also colors, that is a very important an element of, uh, of her design. Um, and it's always uh, used in a very simple, but also direct and efficient way. She's, uh, um, um, and also we can say that most of her creation are real objects. There is always, as I said, stories, but it's always very, very well printed and binded, of course. Um, we can also say about her work that it's definitely pop. And she says herself that uh, one of her uh, main influence is pop art. Um, um, in she acts in her creations also in collusion with the public. She's always thinking about something, tricks or little something that is a connection with the public. Um, and that's exactly what she will do now with us tonight. Please welcome Cléo Charuet for her <laughs> presentation. Bonsoir, hello, thanks for being here. So, I'm Cleo, I work on a desk which is called a bureau, so it's the wrong spelling, so it's Cleo Bureau. Uh, I'm, as Véronique said, independent, freelance working on many different fields. So, I, all my commission work start like um, if I was a shrink going to client, they don't come to me, and listening to their terrible problems of communication or visuals. So I can meet people that are uh, uh, telephone operator that needs to um, give his, uh, 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 his um, sorry, the, the people that the shareholders uh, is bad numbers, so I need to find a way to get go to use num those numbers in a sympathetic way. I uh, can work for, um, let me help myself, take an image. So, telephone companies, I work with, hmm, okay. Okay, technical things. So, airplanes, trains, um, uh, perfume, uh, cosmetic brands, uh, I do, of course, pile of books. Um, so let's take 
like fashion stuff. So um, I work with a sort of unconscious list of ingredients uh, to build a story. I choose for the right type or the for the right word, a color or a contrast, a texture. So is it soft or stiff? Is it shiny or matte? Is rich or poor? The type of images that goes with it, uh, and all this is um, activated by my culture or my intuition on the project. So to those unconscious ingredients that I gather together to make a story, I had most of the time uh, an idea of a game, a play that I uh, give to myself in a sort of gamble, a risk to push an idea that I try not to have seen or try to allow myself to be a little bit goofy or irreverent or provocative or clumsy or sometimes wrong. So in those different, in those many fields, um, I also worked on a cultural project, which is a photographic fair that took place in Paris and in Los Angeles called Paris Photo. So Photo existed uh, for a long time, like 15 years ago, and then uh, in 2011 when I was asked to compete for his uh, rebranding, it uh, took place in the Grand Palais, which is a famous uh, um, building in Paris. So my main uh, goal was to find a way to um, go behind what was my problems with the Paris photo identity is that every year they would use one image. So one photographer would represent the entire pho the photography world from vintage to contemporary. So of course I had to deal with one image too, but I decided to cover it with uh, a logo that needed to be square because of his, its historical visual. So I changed its type to um, uh, a type which is called the Neutra, uh, which is inspired by uh, Richard Neutra, the, the architect. It's a deduction of the type you would use to um, give a number or letter to the building on the, on the front. So it's a sort of um, art deco, very structured um, um, 30s typography. And this is that white square that would obturate the visual uh, was for me an idea to uh, get people to go and see behind it. So that in 2013, that was a, an image uh, by uh, uh, Alex Tiger. I think 2012, yeah, with uh, 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 Ernst and Ila Descher, which had a retrospective at that time. And the first year, there was still the schematic for the photographic fair, and I used a picture by Viviane Sassen. Uh, who is a Dutch uh, photographer who works a lot in uh, Africa. So of course with the visual idea of uh, posters, there was uh, hundreds of declensions of different print objects that are supposed to appear, but don't, yeah? So it's like 10% of what the declension has been. So it would be from invitation to badges to um, um, signage to bags to um, um, scenography for exhibitions to my flow is not fitting with the images or the flow of images is not following me. So signage, again, so it was like, uh, discovering an entire field that I, I mm, didn't know at that time. I had never been, I had never been doing such a wide uh, spectrum of uh, applications. It's uh, called a bug, that little thing <laughs> running. So, well. Okay, uh, so I also took, took care of um, special scenography with, uh, for example, Martin Parr, uh, who did an exhibition on a protest book. So I would 
uh, create all the um, uh, different structure to show things. Um, and then, of course, I, made fam I met famous people like David Lynch, who was asked to, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, was asked to uh, do a selection. Okay. Pose. C'est toujours aussi long, je pense. Non, c'est pareil. Je pense qu'il faut changer de machine. I'm losing my computer. C'est la copie cette fois, c'est ça Anybody does tap dance or? Yeah, but I'm, I, really? Even if, if my Wi-Fi is off? So uh, then I was, and then I. Uh, and this works? Yeah. Attends, it's like that? Yes. Ooh, wow. wow. Flow. Not flow. So an amazing selection of declension of identity, amazing signage in the Grand Palais, amazing signage for a stand, amazing signage for an exhibition, amazing scenography, amazing David Lynch, a real one. So, so we need, um, Paris Photo wanted a celebrity to do an edition which would be a selection of uh, images that he would um, compile together and make his own vision of uh, Paris Photo. So I was speaking about irreverency, and I proposed 
since the system, of the graphic system I developed was obturating, uh, to obturate David Lynch. So it was pretty risky because it was the start of a collection of books. So every year we would have a celebrity and show his face that I would hide. So he could have said no, hopefully he said yes. So the book was designed this way. On the back cover I left his uh, uh, head and portrait. And so the book looked a bit like this. Then uh, um, global design we had to create with Aria 17, which is a really good company, a website. So I took care of that too. And then Paris Photo left Paris in the spring to go to Los Angeles. So then the system needed to, to go to Los Angeles and change a bit. I mean, adapt. So the first uh, Los Angeles uh, visual was um, used with the Ed Rusher uh, picture from 1971. It's actually a picture that he repainted. So it's a picture of Los Angeles, and then he painted around it to, to uh, make, uh, to just leave the, uh, the tree. And when I first sent it to the printer, the printer called and didn't want to print and called me and said I was such a bad uh, Photoshop user because the file was so dirty that he didn't want to use it. So I had to explain the guy that it was an original image from Ed Rusha and that he was coming from the Whitney Museum and that he could go for print. So the uh, identity was spread in the city and then I had to uh, occupy an amazing space which was the Paramount Picture Studio in Los Angeles which is uh, where all the um, sound stage where the sets are built for the movies uh, are and there's also a um, fake New York streets. So we occupied the sound stage and occupied um, the fake streets of New York and I, have to I had to find a way, a cheap way because uh, it's a French company so we don't have that amount of money. So cheap ways to, to find a way to guide people into circulation in the studios. So I used very thick uh, stickers on the floor that would lead to the different spaces and then use the fake streets of New York to make signs uh, in, the, um, in the pole, in the street poles. And then I had that idea when I, I was away from the studio to, um, get, uh, to paint, to make paint the shape of the logo around the number of the stage. And I didn't realize the format, so I asked the team to do it and arrive the next morning and realize that thing was like 10 meters by 10 meters. It was absolutely huge. So my knees were trembling, trembling a bit. And then scenography again and, and signage, and it was a lot of fun. Also, I have, I have no driving license, and that was the only places where I drove in the fake New York. And then there was an, uh, 2013, 2000, 2012, or two, uh, 2013, sorry, uh, the second year of Paris Photo. So I, the color turned to red, so we had to reconsider a new visual, which was a um, Dennis Hopper picture. So it was a sort of mise en abîme, you know, image in an image, uh, on the posters using the red. So that's the original picture. And then there was a lot of thing going on with uh, Dennis Hopper. So from cultural and the Paramount Studio, I also worked a lot with uh, luxury brands like uh, jewelry brands. Uh, so I worked with Cartier, for example. At that time, Cartier had launched, relaunched the appellation of Les Must, which was a selection of uncurrent objects which would go from a hair pin to a USB key in silver with a ruby sign, with a ruby stone on it, or just a simple, um, we say parure, like, um, you know, bracelet and earrings, uh, sets. So I proposed to build a sort of um, children object 
with cutted pages, uh, which would do a sort of um, cadaver cor corpse. Do you say that? Cadaveric ski? Cadaver corpse? Yeah? Okay, cadaveric ski. Look for it. So it's a mix of uncurrent objects together. So this um, idea of the book would permit to fit those leather leaflets with a gold uh, uh, ensemble and those pin needles. So I could add the gag to it like that dog that has nothing to do with Cartier. And um, so those cut out things. This is very expensive USB key. So that was a luxury brand and a very luxurious uh, object. Then I was contacted by a, a French, old, uh, very chic brand called Hermès because they had a very big secret for their year of communication, their main market and their main achievement this year that w they were um, entering an incredible uh, world, which was the house perfume. They were doing a candle. So I, ha I was in a very private um, meeting to, to um, promote those candles. So it's just candles, but it was a pretty nice project. A designer uh, had constructed those ceramics, Guillaume Bardet. Uh, those ceramics are matte on the outside and shiny in the inside. And then there's the candle texture inside of it. So every color would fit with a different smell. And that different smell had a different story and the person that created the smell, we call it a nose, un nez in French. And um, so I started to work on the project and asked for, to a writer to build a series of words that would do those songs. Like in French, we do marabout, bout de ficelle, celle de cheval. It's a, you take the, the end of a word and start another word with it. So the idea was to create um, text like this and to create an object. So it was a simple envelope with the texture of the outside of the ceramic and its side would be just one leaf uh, containing in all its um, bent uh, the different meanings. So it actually was a sort of origami with fold. So it was called the rêverie. So in the, w in the envelope, beside the origami, there would be also um, sort of little brochure, which was greasy. I searched for a paper that a uh, butcher used in which they put uh, meat. So it's um, sort of greasy and it's transparent. So it would fit with the texture of the candle. So it was inside the envelope. And so in all the bendings, you would discover the little stories returned to explain the smell, to give the idea of the smell. Then from Hermès, Hermès in France, they own uh, all the very beautiful leather. So from a cheval on a horseback, we're on cowback. So uh, um, I take care of a brand called RSVP Paris, which is leather. Um, RSVP, it, needs, uh, it means répondez s'il vous plaît, answer please. Do you put this at the end of a very formal invitation. Um, that brand uses very nice uh, skins to make very classical little um, leather goods. So I created the, the identity with, um, it's actually just black and white. Uh, it's a type I'm sure you know called baton which was uh, designed for a GQ uh, lounge in France. So it's really simple. It's um, just these four letters and corners. Um, and really simple uh, way of lay out the text. So that's the leather goods, the kind of things they do. And then I created visuals that would be a sort of allegory of uh, the skin. So. Um, that allegory of a cookie for that um, sort of buttery skin. That's a structure also for the website. 
uh, or an allegory of the caviar for that leather black um, skin. And then the text would do sort of um, surrealistic uh, and winky uh, link to the images. Um, texture of the avocado for that uh, printed the skin or just the matching the color of an eggplant. Thank you. And of course red sausage for red skin. Then from those visual which were kind of uh, their, what I created for the campaign, then started what you know well is in their communication for Instagram, which, need, which needs a lot of uh, energy, a lot of images, because once they're published, they're dead. So I needed to find, first, a, vo a vocabulary that, I, that wasn't used for a leather brand, a classic leather brand, and I had to find an idea where I could nourish um, a, a batch of images really fast. So. I took a pretty easy direction, which was porn. So I've spent a lot of time looking for porn images that I would censor with very nice leather parts. I was, yeah, hiding parts with parts. <laughs> so it's been a really funny series because what you're imagining is even worse. That's what's behind that uh, skin, especially here. Then, yeah, for the f the, there was an entire series which was pretty heterosexual, and then they were accused of being macho, so we didn't have time to communicate the fact that I was a woman make, making the images. So I started to use more um, gay images, uh, which can be both. And then I started to use a lot of gay porn. And then the brand was uh, accused to be tr too gay. <laughs> then there was a porn break. There was an interlude because they are friend with a very serious photographer that did very classic images, putting very nice flowers coming out of the bag. So there's been a very large porn break. Then I had to find an idea and I couldn't go on with porn. I couldn't spend my days looking for porn. So I decided to get to go in a more cultural direction and went to the classics. So went back to museum, quoted Ingres, quoted Picasso, and could do this because it was Instagram. And because on Instagram, you cannot show a tit or a sex, but you can steal images from the great masters of history. <laughs> so <laughs> that's Picasso. Um, that's a very famous Italian painter I forgot. Um, that's Matisse. That's my very favorite because I'm a very big fan um, of David Acne, so it's a splash. That's uh, Tom Wesselman. So that takes us to food. Um, I also take care of um, identities for hotels, restaurants, and especially for a little wine bar called La Buvette in Paris where I, I started to um, do a very uh, like exercise of style with type. Uh, so it's only black and white. I printed on, on old paper that got uh, yellow with the sun, and I only do type composition and also use uh, engravery um, illustrations. So it's a really like an exercise, a little like if I was doing piano. And for that, I use uh, some of Jean-François character most of the time, which is called l'Ambroise. L'Ambroise François et l'Ambroise. And sometimes I do bad things with it. So I'm, depending on the thematic, I use different images. I was uh, attacked of being Nazi uh, on that one on the left. Um, oyster degustation. Um, cider degustation and that was um, I had it took me a, l a while to find the idea it was a Italian uh, a degustation for a special type of wine and then I ended up using a very very cheesy song by Nicole Croisi I'm sure you, you never heard of her it's a French singer and it's a really bad song 
Okay, toi tu es gay comme un italien. It means like you that are, that are that is um, uh, happy like an Italian when he knows that he's gonna have love and wine. And then uh, another series of declensions, and that's where I forced uh, and sorry Jean Francois and slanted uh, badly uh, the Amboise. But he didn't beat me for that, so. Well, if an intern was doing that in my studio, I would be really, really mean, but since I was pretty okay with me. <laughs> then uh, another thematic, another subject, um, bagage, so um, uh, luggage. Luggage, it's a brand uh, that does very classic bag in a canvas, um, it could be like travel bags, it could be uh, shopping bags, it could be sailor bags. So the main thing is that it's um, four colors of canvas and the there are eight colors of layers. So the mechanism is like changing, you can do any combination you want. It looks really boring, but it's the main thing that made me create the identity. So like the... Um, canvas, the brand identity is beige at the beginning. I created the logo on the um, base of a Futura, except that the um, apex, we say, like the les pointes are cut. And I worked on that structure. They had a very strange name, it's called l'uniform, so it's uniform. But in French we put the E. But the L apostrophe is a structure of French, so I had a very it, it didn't look right to me, so I changed the um, apostrophe to a slash, which, I don't know, for me, could justify the fact of having such a wrong spelling. Um, so it it's kind of decided that pyramidal structure that could be also horizontal. So on that base of um, uh, Futura, then there was a Proxima Nova that would play with it, and there's a little portrait somewhere. Um, so the entire structure was, uh, uh, I created a vocabulary which was that beige canvas and added um, graphical reference to flags because uniform, uniform, military, school, flags, da da da. And uh, add a combination of colors that would play with what I was referring to, you know, canvas and borders and combinations of colors. So there was a lot of elements declined in uh, declined declined in di in different colors like this, and it made a pretty big pile of elements, <coughs> from tags to envelopes to uh, business cards, invitations. Uh, there was a press kits, which had those little cuts, and. What I suggested and what I created for them as a vocabulary was uh, to have quotes, quotes from uh, books, from lit literature, literature, from French and France and and uh, the en and English-speaking uh, uh, countries, sorry, and then from songs also. So there was a mix of uh, quotes that would always fit with images. So. The images were also allegories. So instead of showing the container, which was the product, I would show the contents and make for the um, uh, luggage the allegory of, of a voyage, of a trip. Um, and then a visual would fit with a coat, which for, that would, sorry, the coats I was referring to, uh, of course I'm speaking about bags. So for example, Papa's got a brand new bag by James Brown song. That was um, the sailor bag. So it's a quote of a song saying that in my um, um, navy bag, I put everything I, well, well the translation is going to be worse. Dans mon sac de matelot, j'ai mis tout ce que j'avais de plus beau. It sounds better. Um, toiletry bag for women. Le sac des désirs n'a pas de fond, which is a Japanese proverb. Um, the desire bag has no end. And then those pictures where I, I made them as movies also. So each composition was also an animation that would end like the picture. 
So it would work like on every media, it could be either animated or printed, but it would say the exact same story. My favorite, the sport bag, the men making love to socks. So vide ton sac, it means empty your bag. It's uh, Isaac Asimov, sign, a science fiction writer. Uh, your man in it is in that bag by Victor Hugo. The shopping bag. Um, an empty bag stands up, um, are the upright, Benjamin Franklin. And then there was a subject coming in, like um, setting a window at Colette. So I needed to find an idea to uh, be able to speak about the brand with the same tools, but in different spaces. So I decided to create those composition like giant prints. There are layers, like uh, you know those Italian very old theaters. So it's layers of cotton printed and that make the, that's inside Colette, which was my <laughs> main goal, putting a roast beef inside Colette, which has absolutely no sense with the bag. So that was a window from outside, and the left window. And then the year after, I had to find another idea uh, that would uh, compete with the previous one. So I decided to, I decided to brief a guy that would do inflating objects uh, and to make a giant luggage that would uh, just uh, float in the window. So it's behind that gray square. Almost. Okay, so it's an inflated luggage. Let's forget about the, the inflating video. So it looks like this. So it's a only plastic. There's a little machine behind it that gives him hair like in a surgical uh, room. So it's been inflated for a week. And all the layout fits exactly the same um, index um, information that are in the website or in the print uh, in the different communications objects. I made very long stories about how to use a bag and what you could do with it. I wanted to be, I wanted it to be uh, very talkative. Um, and then, of course, there was a website where you could build your bag and create your composition. And so we in invented a sort of engine where you can choose your border and then it can, it's live. Well, it's like fascinating to sell a bag. Then, uh, a few years ago, I was uh, asked by an advertising company, I was called by the boss, actually, of the advertising company, that was in competition for um, a big, um, uh, how do you say, food, food industrial brand uh, to redo their packaging. So I said, I've never done any packaging, why coming to me? So I said, well, yeah, that's the idea. So. I guess because I was very unqualified, I was uh, um, able to push uh, things like not knowing the code. I tried to first understand it and not fit to the rules. So that brand is called Monoprix, and they do fresh products of any kind to um, uh, special dishes, of course, and then anything you need in a house from an um, um, electric bulb to a battery to anything. Toilet paper, whatever. So they were uh, communicating like this with um, this very boring vocabulary of any food brand with a lying visual of a, you know, that piece of rosé, like 
gluing on the tomato, which of course doesn't look like it in it, in the box, using weird colors, and most of the time having bad habits of um, very big labels saying it's bio or um, lots of um, signs that were, um, um, what did I say? Like conventional use, but that weren't any rules I discovered. So they were doing, la, yeah, like all oh, those uh, labels saying, you know, bullshit that you don't need and those, this, this perspective and this, who hits with this fork? Like really strange, strange images. And uh, of course there's no radishes in your, in, in your ham bag and there's no blur garden in it. So, no boat in your tuna box, and no lemon in your batahama. So, because yeah, because mainly what's inside is this. So th all this is a lie. So I decided to just just focus on the main information. Uh, am tahama, its contents, uh, how many they are, what weight, uh, and really the, the main thing that qualified the product. So I started to go to the supermarket and, and find examples. So I started with a, toma a simple tomato box. So tomatoes, tomat, tom, at, entière, like uh, the entire tomato, peeled. It's 425 milligrams, milliliters, sorry and it's uh, preserved in its own juice. So that was the main element. So, uh, sorry, conserved is its own juice, I cut it to au, au jus, with juice. So I just made a pile of the, r the informations. So, tomate entière pelée, 425 millilitres, conserved in their juice. So that, that, that was the main thing. I used a type I, I used to, work with since a long time, which is for me a very well-balanced um, type, which is called Grotsec, which has been designed by uh, a Portuguese designer uh, who was at, at that time, pardon? Feliciano, sorry, Feliciano type, uh, who created it for a surf magazine. So I'm not Portuguese, I don't do surf. I never read it, but I love that type because it's uh, amazingly balanced for me and it fits any uh, I, I add it with um, serif types, it, it always works. So, I needed something that worked like a poster and, and choose that condensed uh, capital that would permit to um, have long words but tiny um, wideness. Well, you, you get it. And so to that compilation of very simple word, I decided to add a joke, a surrealistic word. Since you were obliged to read the information, then inside I inserted a message that had nothing to do with the description, and that would be a little more talkative, so it would be thin. It would be a small, uh, uh, they would, it would need more characters to be small among the wider words that would be the information. So this one for tomatoes, you would say, us when we bored, we peel tomatoes. Um, so that would be the box. And years after I discovered that, uh, not years after, I mean like two years after the project, I realized that I, I did that already. A few years ago, I took care of a magazine for a, an, a publisher. And it was actually, it wasn't the Godsec, but it was the exact same structure of uh, compiling uh, words. And so they, they're, you know, they would fit uh, to, I mean, sorry, their size would fit to the number of characters. So I had kind of done that already. So that was the main idea. Then of course you could change if I made good cuts or wrong cuts. Because you're not permit normally to do tom at, it's a wrong cut in words. But I kind of liked it because it would, um, the reader would be like, what am I reading? Because it it wouldn't be used to read Tom, it doesn't mean anything. And then it works. So 
the, the, it became real. I mean, they took the project, which was pretty amazing. Um, so the exercise was like that. I would start with the main information, Orange, Orange, Oran, it's a city in Algeria. Or, gold, Orange, angel, uh, uh, press, I think we say, base with fridge juice, one liter, and then regarding the different cut in the word, like you understood, uh, the entire design would change um, regarding the size of the uh, type, sorry, and which was a pretty problematic because of course clients would change his mind on the main information, so any change on any line would need, to, the entire design would have to be rebuilt, but it didn't come to their mind to save time. So for that orange juice, you would say, w if with this you're not in good shape, with there's nothing we can do for you. So th that was the system. Then uh, there was a, um, uh, I, I paid really big attention on colors, so I created um, combinations, uh, trying to have very saturated uh, colors with desaturated colors. And I would try to pick colors that are not in that field. So like yogurt, I always light blue. There's no cow that are light blue. So I would pick a color that would make a stain in the shelf uh, so the product would be uh, noticeable. And the idea also to get rid of the lying visual was the fact that in the cell shelf, the, the same shelf, there would be competitors next to it that would use the visual. So the box next to it would have the tomatoes or the, or the beans or whatever, the, it would be in the same shelf with the competitors. So it, for me, didn't need it. So that color, I think, was uh, for electric bulb. That was for toothpaste, coffee, mm, paella. Uh, maybe this one is electric bulb. <laughs> That's the ham. I mean, one of the ham you'll see. Um, an Italian dish or a puree. Mm, cotton things, orange juice. Mm, joker, I don't know. So the, the, when I uh, proposed the project, the client saw this, those, those um, um, simulation, I, flat simulation I was making. So I'd chosen a selection of things I thought would be just to make a, to give them an idea from lamb bulb to ham to um, cookies to to space, to mug or cotton thingy for the year. So I created my shelves. Then came the very big problematic of seeing the product, of course. It couldn't go that easily. So I spent quite a long time explaining that the, 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 the project was good because it was hiding the, the, the product. So if needed, the very lying visual would be on the opposite side, so you needed to turn uh, the box, and it would never be in perspective, always uh, seen from from you know from the top, so there would be no, so it would be scale one, and absolutely no deformation by a perspective. So of course the pizza doesn't look like it in in the box. <laughs> then they wanted it in f in in front, so I came up with that. Uh, I was very pissed to do that. I wasn't happy at all, but. I came up with this, like a smile that would uh, be inserted in the layers. And for the first year, maybe, they didn't use it, and now I think they put them everywhere. But, um, so that's what, what I came up. <coughs> then, 
came the series of products that the client wanted me to design so they would have an entire range that would permit them to declench them to uh, I think like 30 thousands of products now. So I had no brief of course, I had the previous file with no fonts so it would uh, come up on my screen with the wrong fonts most of the time and that would be my brief. So I would have all the information that of course weren't taken out or put in a very clean uh, uh, you know, text file like you're supposed to work with. And I would uh, start the extreme makeover and restructure the entire thing. And I spent quite a while working on that. So that's <laughs> this. <laughs> those very colorful, very instructive information. And now that's what I'm very proud of when I go to the small markets, that's what I'm checking. It's the behind information. So from that exercise, I could notice that all those um, um, supposedly rules of uh, having the recycling logo at whatever size they wanted was, or there was no rules. I could do whatever I wanted, just needed to very slowly and nicely explain it to the right people so they would agree with it. So before and after. <laughs> before, oh yeah. At that time when I was doing the project, um, the Nespresso license uh, was coming to what we say is public space. So those little capsule, uh, anybody were able to copy them. So Monoprix that belonged to the Group Casino decided, of course, needed, wanted to launch the redesign of Monoprix with the capsules because they thought that anybody want, would want to buy it in a supermarket and not at this way. So, so started a very long uh, adventure with coffee. So that was the first um, makeover. But there was, that, that's one coffee, which is Expresso du Matin for the morning. But there was also the one from India. Uh, and there was the caffeine-free one. And then there was the Pura Arabica. So it looks like nothing, it moves slowly, but everything actually moves, so it needed to be reconstructed every time regarding the text. Then they wanted the capsule to be seen. So at first I drew it and put it behind. Then they wanted a very nice picture and they wanted to have a very, very good logo. Anything that designed this is fired. So, okay. Then long, long process. Because mainly it's very interesting to uh, come up with the idea and make it, but then, you know, spending hours moving uh, a type or a box, or just changing the color is very, is really not interesting in my work. So, still I'm very proud of the project, but, but it, it was pretty depressing to spend hours doing this. And then my main adventure is ham. Because ham, where they put this box is, this one here, the white box, is for the, um, oh we, well next time. This white box contains the um, date where you have to, you, you cannot eat the ham anymore. But this box is placed by the guy who produced the ham at the time it's being produced in that region of France. It's his machine deciding where this box is. But if like three months after there's a guy who is cheaper in the north of France and it's another machine so it's another shape and it's under but it's out of the place for the box. So, um, it's been quite a long time to get all those information together and come up with a way to uh, arrange all this. So, that's the Jambon de Paris, four slices with no, you know, grease. But then there was the superior am with no grease, but, but different way with four slices too. Then there was four thin slices with no grease, but like high quality. And then there was with grease, but two uh, slices. 
and then there's no, no, two slices with less salt, and a long project. So that's the real packaging. There's a lot of jokes in it, and I have no idea how to translate them in, in uh, English. Like, this one is impossible, sorry. I might have examples. No, the, the boudin, forget, the blood sausage it would be impossible, I'm very sorry. But then I have, I have some, I have some example in English, like, it's not that example, but it's aspar asparagus cans, and you say when it comes to asparagus, size matters. Or for half fat milk, it would say at half fat milk is produced by skinny cows. Or for the butter we saw before, it said the uh, tasted and approved by the little red riding hood. So after a year, I, I uh, designed the project, the, um, it came out, and I suggested that all the campaign would use exactly the same tools. So just showing the product and giving a message, I didn't compose it, so you know, because the spacing is like impossible, I didn't do it. Um, but so it would, the, the visual and the message would be in the same space, two different postures, so there would be the milk, so it would be exactly like this. So that was uh, the lounge with the, those visual just in white sp uh, space. And then uh, the idea was to create gigantic um, packaging. It's actually at the centre, center, you know, Pompidou Centre in Paris, and it's absolutely forbidden to put any advertisement in that place. So. I don't know who came up at the ad agency, came up with that idea of making it into a scooter so it wouldn't look like an ad but would look like an artist project. And it seems like the Mairie de Paris agreed. And that was in front of uh, um, train stations. And then me, like a freak, I would go to the supermarket and photography every good packaging I would see. So I had the security guy coming to me like a weirdo and wondering what I was doing with my phone, making pictures every day of the product. And then after people send me products, everybody would speak about what they buy. So I would meet neighbors, you know, in my stairs and they would stop and then they would empty their bags and show me their packs. And then, so I had few friends gathering stuff and sending me images. <laughs> so I decided to um, um, make an ad and ask people to send me images so I, so I could do a compilation of the products in their daily life. So please do, and send me images to cleo at cleobureau.com. <laughs> please participate. Recently, I have to say, I, read, I was reading a French author, feminist author, which is called um, Virginie Despentes, and she defines a character when she started a chapter, uh, which is a guy who is uh, like very fiddle to his, um, uh, fidèle, no? Um, well, the, the guy is a married guy, and uh, his wife obliges him to go shopping, and he hates it, and he goes to, to Monoprix. And then the part where he says, this fucking regressive packaging is aggressive. Can you imagine that some guys in offices spent weeks discussing the right color to use on a pickle can? All this cleverness fully lost. Merci beaucoup. Thanks very much, Cleo. You, for sure, have questions, guys. Yes, question. Um, please, can you help us? Uh, 
Thank you very much for that. Is it ever hard um, being an individual and feeling like maybe you don't pull as much weight as perhaps bigger studios when it, when it comes to working with big um, clients? I'm really sorry. I have no idea what you're asking me. Can <laughs> you spell that accent. again in a different way? I didn't understand. You work as an individual, yeah? yeah. Is that ever difficult, um, feeling like you're maybe a smaller fish than other bigger studios? Oh, definitely. And, and the difficulties that come with that? Especially now, yeah. yeah. Well, it's been, it's been actually extremely uh, motivating to be alone. Especially when I got, because I got prices in design, so I did like the um, um, art director's club in French, and the, the next day after the prices, there would be name of those big brands and they would be clear, shall they, in small, <laughs> and inserted in line, that would be very exciting. But I have to say it's a tough, uh, it's a tough period, so it's uh, not that easy to be a, a warrior independent. Because actually big companies make too many, um, I mean they accept too many things and I accept to cut all budgets, and I'm not gonna develop this, but, but this means that they're actually shooting a, a, a bullet in our feet, of all of us, because we can't uh, sell ideas anymore. Um, I'm, I'm a tourist in France, so I bring home all these <laughs> Monoprix packaging. I can send you several photos I have oh yeah, of, like of these things at home. And I never notice the jokes, of course, because I cannot read it. I can read cafe and oranges and stuff. We and could go together. I could try yeah. to help. Well, <laughs> I, I, I need the translation or I need to ask friends. But I wanted to know if you are writing all the texts no. or did they? So no, no, I, someone I, is texting. I gave the idea and I briefed, um, you know, what we call the redacteur. I mean writers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's been like I don't know hundreds of uh, writers because of course that there was a time where they needed to produce really really fast yeah that was what so I, I was wondering so I created examples and then after it's those. been I, I discover them every day uh, <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah that was my question if you read the jokes yeah. yourself <laughs> thanks encore une question I found really interesting that uh, most of the projects have uh, really strong typographic solutions, uh, even more, even <laughs> many of your projects have the really strong typographic solutions, even more, the typography plays a uh, principal role even more than the images. Uh, do you do this because um, many times we're overflowed with uh, images and expectations and typography is may maybe a, a more honest way to communicate. Uh, uh, just I wondering. I never thought about it this way, but yeah, it's quite right. Yeah. Um, there's also there's a thing that really matters to me is that things. I don't want things to look rich. I mean, even like for Cartier, the example I showed. Yeah, it it takes a lot of energy and a lot of people to all do all those bendings or those cutouts. But still, it doesn't look like. A rich object. It's not. It's not like too shiny or too produced. So it's the main. It's um, the same thing with images. I, I use small ingredients, but I need the but strong ones. Uh, and also, it's because well, I'm I'm making more images. Like um, um, you know, the the the, the uniform thing is in an RSVP. It's things I shoot because my boyfriend a photographer, so he helps me with light and it's things I shoot. But it's also, it's not my main um, uh, um, skill. So the, it's a mix of uh, economy and skills and also it's things that really talks to me. I mean, you put a word on a, on a color background and I'm like super happy. <laughs> the right word though. Yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Thank you for that speech. Sorry, my voice is gone. Um, so how do you find, in this sort of huge sea of, of wonderful fonts mixed with terrible ones as well, how do you, how do you, what resources do you use and how do you find those and, and do you find yourself going back to similar ones more often like this one you had mentioned or are you always looking for something new and the next I'm, I'm not like a big, I'm not a big searcher. I. I have a lot. I have to say, I discover new fonts with uh, students, with uh, interns, or 
that are more obsessed than me. I, I, it's like it's like you know your style. Like you know, you know, I have a certain age, and I know how to dress myself. I don't make any mistakes anymore. I mean, not so much. It's like the same thing. I know my good friends in types. So I, I know my taste, and I know I like very good balance. I like a, a special kind of serif. I hate when they look too technical. I hate when they look too 90. There's a certain balance unconscious, I guess, in my head that makes me choose a very good font. But uh, like, I forbid myself to go to village or to go to, you know, to those founder because I know I'm going to have a crash and it's going to cost me a fortune. So I try to do that like <laughs> once, once a year or once two, a year, two times a year. And I buy a really nice full font. Um, I, I work like that. You can have our <laughs> 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 oh, cool. Wow. <laughs> Encore une question? Oui. Okay. Uh, I know this is your baby. <laughs> uh, uh, not anymore. The, he has a lot of mothers now. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I was going to ask you. It, it, is now your baby somebody else's baby, or do you still have well any it's, control? Um, I, um, I created the entire system so it could be declined, de declined, declined by, other people. by other people. So I made sure the system was, a, was working. But do you still have your word no. of say? Uh, no, no. So I was out can, really fast, actually. They can sort of mess up what you, your concept. Well, they're it messing it up today because it's an advertising company, and advertising doesn't care about the quality of the project. They need to keep the client. Yeah. So they would feed any of his demands, which of course I wouldn't do. I would fight to keep the project coherent. But it took a lot of punches since quite a while. For example, now, I don't know why they use, they create a new logo for Monoprix. They have a Monop, and they made a, a you know, like a like bubble, like in cartoons. And now they use it as a, Quote? As code signs yeah. for the jokes. Yeah. So they put little accidents. They go back to the labels, like at the beginning. They, they put yeah. like eight little accidents. And then also, I think, like the book said, they were uh, annoyed by the fact of uh, having to agree to a color. So that would, need, uh, the, the would need, that would mean a proposition for a combination of colors, and that would mean a board saying yes to that color for the gherkin, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or, or uh, you know, somebody agrees, uh, somebody to agree, and a bunch of people to agree. So they stopped that also. So what I showed you as a brief for the original uh, file are now also a brief in color. That's what I heard. So even the color is their, their responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Must. Yeah. Uh, it was very sad to to uh, leave the the uh, project, but I think on the other hand, that's why I'm like here and standing. That would have been really hard, because because uh, again, I'm independent, and very big agency don't want independent to show that they can do the same job. They can. I couldn't, of course, sell that amazing project to a company. I I don't have the the skills. I didn't learn to do marketing, but but. Uh, uh, even though they had their uh, very big talent of being able to sell it to come to, to that, you know, just big brother food uh, project, um, they didn't want to, to prove that an independent could come up with it. So, well, it's always a question of ego, but uh, yeah, I'm out, but, but it's alive, so it's cool. Encore une question? Uh, so I was wondering if you proposed several ideas to the client when you were proposing this one, and did you have to fight for this, or it just I happened naturally? I actually proposed naturally? two. Uh, my, my obsession was the fact that the declension would be possible by any monkey in the food industry. So uh, I needed to, I wanted absolutely to find a, a process that was um, applicable. And even actually for this, I wanted some Swiss guy to develop an a application that would permit to just give the text and it would uh, actually make the layout, which is pretty easy with a you know, mathematical... Um, this, this is Jean-François Porcher uh, screensaver. <laughs> and um, 
Oops, it's back. Uh, so the, the first idea was even poorer than this one. It looked like an um, uh, East or Russian supermarket brand with illustration, but like really poor uh, vocabulary of illustration with lines and, and backgrounds. So even a wrong drawing would work. And it was a gros sec also, but it was centered, really easy, uh, at the same format. So, but I, I didn't have to push it because again, it's a big brother of food industry. So they had um, um, you know, a panel of users to choose the project. And the panel of users hated the other one, like thought it was absolutely disgusting. And hopefully choose this one. <laughs> Encore une question? I have one for you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the colors? Because uh, color is something very important in all your projects, as, as we've seen. And where does it come from? Um, how, I did you, how did you practice this? And well, what I remember is that I, I, I did a school called Penningen, which is a very tight uh, school. I entered in the second year, actually. And there was some color uh, classes where I studied the uh, Johannes Iten. I don't know if you heard of him. And I've spent a lot of time making colors. So I used a lot of um, water-based uh, uh, paintings and also acrylics. I, I, I was, I was in school before even Penningen, I would draw and paint. So I had that knowledge of color was, which, which was very far from, com from computer. I didn't even learn type, actually. I know I look very young, but I didn't learn type and computer. And um, so I mean, I mean computer arrived later. And uh, so I studied you know, saturation, full color, um, um, broken colors, desaturated and everything. I, I, and then, I don't know, color became like a very strong actor for me. Like it would have a lot of meanings in terms of contrast, like black and white or a character versus another, or so it would be an actor as important as the others for my little ingredients to create a story. Merci beaucoup. On va remercier très chaleureusement. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci.